Okay, last week we did the courtyard and we thought we learned about the bronze altar and we learned about the bronze lever, which was a water basin. We learned how important those two were. Mainly the water basin where the priest would cleanse and rinse and purify themselves by washing. The word washing doesn't mean taking a bath. The word washing meant spiritually. How he cleanses us and how he purifies us with his words. And he shows it through washing, the water. Because what did I say the water is? The Bible says the water is living water. When he says water, he's talking about living water. And he's given us that. Now we're going from the courtyard. Now we're going to go into the other tent that's sectioned off in two sections. The first section is the holy place, which that's where we're going to be tonight. And then the next section is the holies of holies, which we'll get that next time. But now we're in the holy place. And the holy place has three objects in it. And we're going to see what those three objects are. And right before you get into the holies holies, there's a curtain with cherub rims on the curtain. And there's four pillars. And we're going to get more into that later. But that separated the holy place from the holies of holies. The first thing we're going to look at is the golden lamp. It was a single piece of gold. It wasn't pieced together. It was just one solid piece of gold. Its purpose was to provide light in the tent. Because in that tent, it was total darkness. They had no windows. They had no light from the outside. It was total darkness. So this lamp gave light in that tent. And the reason it did it, it was to show the light on the altar of incense. And it was to show the light on the showbread. Which we're going to be talking about those two. But that light shined on those so the priests would know what to do. And that resembles us. Jesus is our light. And without his light, we can't do our ministry. We need his light in us so we can do our ministry. Just like the priests. They couldn't do what they had to do with the showbread. And they couldn't do what they had to do with the, uh, with the altar of incense. Without that light. This, Like I said, this tabernacle represents Jesus totally. Amen? Amen. Now there was no measurements on the lamp. And by me reading commentaries and other places, uh, most preachers and teachers, they believe that's because who can put the measurement on the light of God? Who can measure that? The light of God. That's why they believe God gave, I mean, he gave measurements for everything. I want this to be this long, this wide, this tall. He gave measurements for everything, but he didn't give measurements for the lamp. Because, like I said, and I, and I agree with him. Who can put a measurement on the light of God? Trimming the lamp wicks to keep them burning brightly was an important job for the priests. God instructed Moses to use 75 pounds of gold to make that lamp. 75 pounds of gold, one piece. You got people who probably wanted to look for this tabernacle. And of course, like always, money, 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 money. 75 pounds of gold, oh yeah, that can go a long way. But not for us. That golden lamp. As far as it being in gold, we don't look at money. We look at the Lord. Amen. Amen. The, the, shaft, the, the shape of it was a central shaft. It had six branches. One in the middle, but three on, the, on each side of it. And they didn't use wax for fuel. They used high quality olive oil for it to burn. Like I said, they had seven cups of, on the golden lamp. Seven in the Bible is the number of perfection. That's what seven means. Perfect. So this golden lamp was a symbol of Jesus being the perfect light. Amen. Amen. When I was studying this, I was like, hey, amen. <laughs> amen. I love studying. I see stuff like that. The Lord shows me stuff and I'm, that's why I like to, I love to study because yeah. he's showing me and I'm just like, I'm at all every time I read the Bible. Hmm. When he shows me what the verses mean. And it was the high priest who was the only one who could take care of the lamp. His responsibility was to keep it burning day and night. Leviticus 24.3 Outside of the veil, talking about the holy place, in the tent of the meeting, shall Aaron keep it in order from evening to morning before Yahweh continually. Of course, y'all know Yahweh means God. It's a name for God. It shall be statute forever throughout your generation. The lamp stand 
would give light, but oil was was required to keep the light burning. If there wasn't oil, the light couldn't shine. And what is what is the oil represents in the Bible? It represents the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, the light of God couldn't. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, how are you going to shine? Right. Amen. Amen. If we don't have the Holy Spirit living in us, our light can't shine. Which the Holy Spirit is who? Jesus. And Jesus is who? God. So without the oil, they couldn't burn the light. The oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit who has given us our high priest, which is Jesus Christ, has come in us to show the brightness of his word of God to the world, to a lost world. Isaiah 9.2 The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light that they... They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. We're learning who the light is. What the lamp represents. It says, upon them hath the light shined. And that, that goes with John chapter 1. He will enlighten everyone. There's no one who's going to go to heaven and say, I didn't know. Because in 1 John, it plainly says, not 1 John, John chapter 1, it plainly says it. He enlightens everyone. Enlightens the heart of every man. Everyone. Even if you're in the deep part of Africa, in the jungle, he's going to show himself to them people. When he says every, he means every. Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. How many of us live, live that way? We let the Lord guide us in everything we do. Everything. He's a light to our path. He's a light to our feet. He gives us the directions. And if we stay in His directions, can we go wrong? No. No. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Will not walk in darkness. So, if you're walking with the Lord, it is impossible to walk in darkness. When you're walking with the Lord. His ministry is to guide us. That's his ministry. His Holy Spirit. It guides us in truth. On how to walk. How many of us. And you don't have to say or raise your hands. How many of us. Really truly. Look for our guidance. In the word of God. Not on TV. Not on what everybody else is doing. Just on the word of God. If you're not. Just repent. Lord forgive me I need to look to your words only I don't need the commercials or the TV to show me how to live I don't need my friends to show me how to, no all I need is you Amen. and that's what I need and that's what I'm going to go by John 8 verses 31 and 32 then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him if ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's an amen and an amen. If we abide in Jesus, in His truth, in the Bible, we will be set, set free. Well, set free from what? All the problems that come your way. All the trials and tribulations that come your way, you're set free from that. If you depend on the Lord to see you through it. Amen. amen? You're set free from getting stressed out or going to a depression. You're, you're free from that. That's big. Yeah. I mean, if you really look at it, that's, Lord, if I just look to you, all these things that could stress me out, that could put me in a depression, it doesn't because I'm looking to you. Amen. These are beautiful words of God here. These are beautiful. I mean, I hope y'all are hearing the word, not me. I hope y'all are hearing what God is telling us. I will set you free by my truth. Amen. Jesus brought light and life to those living in darkness and death. John 3 verses 19 through 21 and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved meaning shown but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be manifested that they are done in God. So what we do is going to be shown. And how are they? How we? How do we do it? In God. How we live, how we show, 
is done through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, For God, who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Also, Isaiah 60, verse 19, The sun shall be no more than light by day. Uh, we're talking about a physical light, the, the sun. Neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But, but, the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light. This light don't go out. When it gets dark, it's, 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 it's dark because the, the sun's not there no more. But right here, this light never goes out. It's an everlasting light. And thy God, thy glory. This light. The more we learn about the light, I mean, when I say light, just put Jesus there. Because that's what we're talking about. Jesus is everlasting. Revelations 21, 23. And, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. God gave us light. It's not the one, it's not the moon, it's not the sun. It's His Son. He gave us the light. This light, I'm telling you. You want to shine? Amen. Light. Shine. Walk with the Lord. And you know who you're giving the glory to? To God. You're not going to be popular with lost people. But how many of us here want to be popular with the lost people? With darkness. That's the darkness. Lost people is darkness. How many of us want to be popular with darkness? If you're a true born again Christian, that's not what we want. We want to be a light to God. To the world, but it pleases God. The sea is walking in the light. Walking in the Lord. Amen. Amen. This is what the lamp represents in the tabernacle. The light of God. The light of Jesus. The light of the Holy Spirit. That's what the lamp represents. Now there's a table of bread of presence or showbread. The priest would place new bread on the table along with plates and pitchers. The bread represented the twelve tribes of Israel. Every seventh day fresh loaves were provided. And only the priests were able to eat the old loaves that were, that, that were replaced. Only the priests could eat those loaves standing in the holy place. Hebrews 10.11 it says, Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifice. So in, in, Levit in Leviticus chapter 22 it says, If a priest was unclean he couldn't eat of the showbread. So they were in there all the time, often. And they ate of the showbread, but they had to be worthy. They had to be cleansed to eat of the showbread, it says. It says that in Leviticus chapter 22. They had to be clean. They had to be clean to eat the bread. Now, who are we talking about again? Who is the bread of life? Who are we talking about the Lord again? He was the lamp. Now he's the showbread. We need the bread. God gave instructions for the preparation of the bread and the arrangements of the table. It was a visceral reminder of the covenant God made with Israel to be their king, to be their God, and he would protect and provide for them. So those of us who accept him as our God, our king, what's he going to do? He's going to protect and provide for us. Now Israel, on the other hand, God was going to do this, but what did Israel have to do? Israel had to be faithful and obedient to his commandments. Does that go for us also? Uh -huh. Yes. He'll give us this protection. He'll provide us with what we need. In return, what we do is be faithful to Him and obey Him. That's what He wants in return. To obey Him. This was to represent the covenant meal, which was the Lord's Supper, that showbread. Luke 22, 19 and through 20, it says, And He took bread and gave thanks and break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body. We're talking about bread, right? Mm -hmm. The Lord is saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. God is the bread. God is the bread. And this showbread they had in the tabernacle and the holy place, like I said, is Jesus. It's Jesus again. The only reference to the new cup, new covenant, and the old covenant 
is in Jeremiah. This is the only place where it talks about the new covenant. Jeremiah verse, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. It says, and I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible. The day is coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant. They broke the covenant. Though I love them as a husband loves his wife. Husbands, how are we supposed to love our wives? The Lord said, He said, Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their heart. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will need to teach their neighbor, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Which we know that. But what he's talking about here. And they should know me. The relatives. And they should all know me. Which in Israel. They should all know. Because God's been with them from the very beginning. So the Israel does know about God. They know completely about God. But they broke the covenant with them. But they know. They know. Now they don't know about Jesus Christ the Messiah. Because they didn't receive him. But they did know about God. That's why he's saying, I don't need to, you don't need to tell them, your neighbors and your relatives about me. Because they already know me. That's why he said that here. Also, the Lord wasn't speaking to the church here. He wasn't, because he's making a new covenant with Israel and Judah. That's what it says, right? Israel and Judah. And the reason I say he's not speaking to the church is because the new covenant will be with God's chosen people as the yo. That's why he said it. Also to their ancestors. They weren't our ancestors. Those were At the time it was just Israel. I hope you understand what I'm saying. He's talking to Israel and Judah here. Because that's who the first covenant was with. Now he's made a new covenant. Because of this new covenant. Which I'll get to in a minute. Now he's going to be speaking to us. But since, since Israel. Rejected the covenant with the Lord. Now we are offered the redemption. Which goes to all people now. All Gentiles. And we'll see that in Matthew's verse 22, no, chapter 22, verses 8 through 10. Then saith he to his servants, the, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. And who is he talking about there? He's talking about Israel, yeah. the Jews. So he says, since they're not ready, verse 9, go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Tom, they're invited to the marriage. So those servants went out onto the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So since the Jews rejected it, he's saying, hey, go out there. Out there. Go on the highways. Go out there and see whoever wants to receive me, whoever wants to be my guest, invite them to come. Right. Also in Romans chapter 11, verse 28 through 32, it says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news and this benefits you Gentiles this benefit us amen? amen yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors talking about Abraham Isaac and Jacob for God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn because he offered them this he it says you know he couldn't withdraw it because he offered it to them verse 30 once you Gentiles were, once the Gentiles were, were rebellious against God. But when the people of Israel became rebellious against Him, God was merciful to, to us instead. Now they are rebels, talking about the Jews, and God's mercy has come to you that they too will share in God's mercy. So once we were the rebellious ones, but now since the Jews are the rebellious ones, He's come to us. And there's Gentiles who are rebellious also. There's not very many that are going to go to turn to the Lord anyway. Just very few. So what God is saying, He will give us the Holy Spirit to put His laws in our minds and in our heart. He will be our God and we will be His people. He says in the New Covenant, we will know the Lord. 
we will know the Lord. He will forgive us of our wicked, wickedness of sin. Amen? Amen. Forgive us. Matthew 26, 28, it says, For this is the blood of the New Testament, meaning the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. Jesus called himself the bread of life in Matthew 6, 35. And that's what he was, the bread of life. Does the bread we eat, does that give us life? No. No. People, people can eat bread every day, every meal. They're still going to end up and die. So he's saying, I'm the bread of life. So he's talking about his words. But he's talking about him. I'm the bread of life. Take me. Take my bread. So now, the third object was the altar of incense. Now don't get confused with the bronze altar and this altar. Remember, the bronze altar is the one that sat in front of the wide gate in the courtyard. That's where they brought the sacrifices. Right in front of the, the wide gate. This altar is right in front of the Holy of Holies curtains. And it's a little smaller than the one outside. The altar had horn, horns on the corners and they would sprinkle the blood of the animals to cleanse and purify Israel from their sins. So the animal was sacrificed on the altar outside, but then just the blood was brought to the, in, to the altar that was in the holy place. And they would sprinkle it on that altar. Not the animal, just the blood. Priests had to burn incense at the altar twice a day and night. The Lord required that special incense be burned constantly on the, order, on the altar. It was a special sweet incense. It was a mixture he, he put together. Spices that he put together just for that. It was only, only that incense could be used inside the tabernacle. They could in no way burn anything else on that altar. I've showed you this already before that Aaron's two sons offered a strange fire. Meaning different from what the Lord commanded. And it says in Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1 and 2. Aaron's sons put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. And this way they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died therefore there before the Lord. Is the Lord serious? Do we play with Christianity? Do we play with the Lord? I suggest very highly that you don't play with the Lord. He's very, very loving, merciful. But he's also very, very stern. He means what he says. We are just to believe him and obey him. And we will. If we love him, if he's in our heart, if we put him in our heart, why did we put him in our heart? Because of what he did. He saved us. He gave us salvation. It cost him his life. One of the functions of the incense was to counteract the odor that was rising from the blood. Because blood stinks from animals. But it was to cover that odor in, of the sacrifices. And like the tabernacle itself, incense provided a visual reminder, reminder to Israel to the, for their faith. To believe that, that, that God is there. Always there. That's what the incense, the smoke. And just as the smoke of incense ascended toward God in heavens, and the aroma pleased the Lord. That's what he says. It pleased them. That's what we ought to do as Christians. We need to please the Lord. Like I've said several times, we need to please Him. Our, our incense, our prayer, I'm going to show you how incense, meaning prayer, goes up to Him. We, sh we, should, be, we should do whatever we, the Lord says to please Him. And this is one place He says, that aroma, that, that smoke that comes from us praying, which let me get to that, and that way you can understand what I'm saying. The incense was a symbol of prayer, and in intercession of the people going up to God as a sweet fragrance. God wanted his dwelling to be a place where people could approach him and pray to him. And you'll find that in Isaiah 56 7. It says, For my house, and at that time at that time the tab the tabernacle was his house. He says, For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Remember, the tabernacle was God's house. Remember, remember that. That's going to come into play later. But remember, the tabernacle is God's house. Now the altar is to represent Christ, who is our intercessor before God. 
the Father. During his days on earth, Jesus prayed for the believers. He prayed for us. Right before he was portrayed and sentenced to death, Jesus interceded for his disciples and all the believers, asking God to guard them from evil and sanctify them with his word. And we'll find that in John 17, verses 9 through, through 15. Now this is Jesus praying for us to the Father. Okay? Jesus praying for us. I pray for them. Talking about the Christians. I pray not for the world, the lost people, but for them which thou hast given me. How do we get saved? We're drawn by the Father. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I'm glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, the Christians. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Do you feel like you're one with God? If you don't, maybe you're not walking that close to Him. But He says right here, He says, that they may be one. So that's this is coming from Jesus. We, we need to be one with our Father. Just like He said, just like I am. And remember, Jesus was 100% man. Verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of petition, meaning Judas, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. It was just fulfilled that, that, that one of the disciples was going to betray Jesus. They called him the son of petition, and that was Judas. Verse 19, uh, 13. And now come, I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. The world's hated who? Christians. Because they are not of the world. We are not of the world. Who? Do we want to act like the world? No. Do we? No, we don't. That's darkness. Like I said, we, we have no business with darkness, with the lost people. He says, because they are not of the world. So, if you want to know if you're walking with the Lord, are you acting like the world? Or are you different from the world? Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shalt keep, shouldest keep them from the evil. And we know who the evil is. Like I said, this is Jesus interceding for us to the Father now he's asking the Father God to take care of us to protect us what do we need to do we need to walk with him because he says protect them from the world he's saying protect them from the lost people to protect them from the evil the devil can he well yeah he can greater is he that is in me which is the Lord than he that is in the world and who's in the world who, who does the world belong to right now? The, devil. the prince and power of the air, which is the devil. Romans 8.34 Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who raised to life, is at the right hand of God and, also, and is also interceding for us. Amen? That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, because Jesus is the one that's interceding for us. Are we supposed to pray to saints? Did it say anything here about saints? Can they intercede for us? No. no. Can Mary intercede for us? Which a lot of people pray to Mary. A lot of people. But it's not reaching God. Because the only prayer that reaches God is in the name of Jesus. That's it. Praying in the name of Jesus, what you're doing is you're praying in authority. You use the name of Jesus, you're praying in authority. <coughs> Amen? Amen? Hope you understand what that means. Psalms 141.2 Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. That's why we're saying the, the, the table of incense, the altar of incense. That's, that's what it says right here. Let, me prayer, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. It's saying that in verse... In this verse, the lifting up of our hands as an evening sacrifice, which means in, in Exodus chapter 29, it speaks about the burnt offering. And, this, and it's symbolic of totally, totally belonging to God. Totally. 
God wants a hundred percent. He doesn't want Christians to, well, I walk with you sometimes, but sometimes in the world. He don't want that. In Revelation, he said, if you do that, you're just riding the fence. He says, I'd rather just spit you out of my mouth. That's what God thinks about you doing both. You can't do both. Either you're, either you're going to be a Christian or you're not. Period. Either you walk with the Lord or you don't. And He knows if you, He knows your heart better than, than we know your heart. He knows your heart better than you know your heart. And he's saying, hey, you're either for me or you're against me. It's only There's no in-between. There is no in-between. You're either for me or you're against me. That's what he says. Our lifted hands show that we give up doing things our way. Remember, we give ourselves totally to him. And we've given up doing things our way. Because doing things our way, we're getting nowhere. Right. Or we're getting somewhere, but it's not the right way. We need to realize that happiness comes from the Lord. Doing it His way, that's where we get our happiness. Now, lifting holy hands, I was in a, I was in a Catholic church one time, and they had a singer there. I, I enjoyed this singer. That's why I went to, to listen to him. And, and his songs were just full with the Spirit. And there was, there was some of us in there, we, we lifted our hands to the Lord through praise. And believe it or not, the priest came out there and said, we don't lift hands here in this church. I, I mean, I was there. This is not a story I heard. I saw it for myself. I heard it for myself. Watch, watch, watch. What church you go to and who, what doctrine you're listening to. It's very important. Now, lifting holy hands, That's the world does that. When you surrender, when if you're in the army or whatever and you, and you surrender, what do you do? You throw up your hands showing that you surrender. Well, we're sur- surrendering. We're surrendering our life to the Lord so He can take over. Because we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to live. Amen? Amen. Now let me show you who these sacrifices are going to. The question is, okay, are they going to God? Or are they going to Jesus? Because Jesus was a sacrifice. So all these sacrifices, are they going to God or to Jesus? Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Let me show you. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Now when you see the Lord capital letters in the King James, when you see Lord in all capital letters, it's talking about God. When you see Lord with just a capital L, then it's talking about Jesus. And when you see Lord with, with all small letters, it's talking about you know someone who's over somebody. Okay? Right here it says, Ye are my witnesses, saith Jehovah, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So what, what is God saying? There is no other God, and there's not going to be none after me. Now listen, listen to the scriptures. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord God, and besides me there is no Savior. Keep these words in your mind. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus saith the Lord, Jehovah, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord, Jehovah of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Verse 8 of 44. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have, I, have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. This is all what Jehovah God is saying. Isaiah 45 verse 5. I am the Lord Jehovah and there is none else. There is no God besides me. Amen. This is what he's saying. Isaiah 45 verse 21 and 22. Tell ye and bring them near. Yet let thy take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time. Who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord, Jehovah, and there is none God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. So God is saying, hey, there is not going to be no other God. I am the only God. I am the Savior. That's what he's saying, right? Now, let's read some New Testament. 
Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 The angel of the Lord told Joseph who would have a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. The Old Testament said God said he's the only savior. Right? But now it's saying Jesus he shall save his people from their sins. Uh oh. Jesus. Luke 2.11 for unto you are born this day is the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So, are we looking at the Bible contradicting itself? Because God plainly says there is none beside me. He's plainly saying it. He is the only Savior, right? So, either we have to believe the Bible has contradictions, or we have to believe that Jesus is God. Amen? Amen. Revelations chapter 1 verse 17 and 18 And when I saw him I fell at his feet as dead And he laid his right hand upon me Saying unto me fear not I am the first and the last well, Wait a minute That's what God said I am the first and the last in the Old Testament Verse 18 I am, I am he that liveth and was dead So we're talking about Jesus here Was God ever dead? No, no we're talking about Jesus I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Speaking of Jesus again. Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now how can the Jehovah Witnesses say... Jesus is not God. Yeah. How can they? I mean, I just gave you verses from the Old Testament showing you that God said, There is no other God besides me. I am the Savior. I am the first and the last. I am the only God. But now we're reading in Matthews that Jesus is that way. Right. Like I said, you can only take it two ways. The Bible is contradicting itself or Jesus is God. There's more though. First John 5.7 for there are three that bear record in heaven. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now, what do these people who who don't believe that Jesus is God, what do they do with this verse? Yeah, really. I mean, this is, this is the Word of God. The inspired Word of God, right? Yeah. The inspired Word of God. And God is saying, they're one. Yeah. Those three are one. This is the scripture. I mean, it's the scriptures. Yeah. I'm not saying, well, because of what I just read, I think all three of them are one. No, no. The Bible plainly says it. The scriptures plainly say it. The three are one. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Uh, isn't that what God said? He's the only one who can forgive. Right here, Jesus is saying that He forgives. Matthew 9 2. And behold, they brought to Him a man sick of the palsy, laying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their face, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Even the religious Pharisees, the religious leaders, even when this happened, they even said, only God can forgive sin. So with Jesus doing all this, as soon as they heard him say, your sins are forgiven, then they should have stoned him. But, but knowing the scriptures, they should have fell down their, on their knees and started to worship him. Right. Recognized him as being God. Because only God can forgive sin. Right. And Jesus said, thy sins are forgiven. Exodus 14.21 and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord, the Lord, caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. So who gave the power to Moses to, to split the sea? The Lord did. But then we read in Matthew 8, chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. It says, And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples, why are ye fearful? Why ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. 
But the man more was saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Who did they obey in the Old Testament? God. Who, they, who are they obeying here? Jesus. Shown again, Jesus must be God. Luke 8.25 He said unto them, Where is your faith? And they bring, and them being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds, the water, and they obey him. So I'm just showing. What, Jesus, what God said over here, Jesus is doing over here. Yeah. And God said he's the only one. There is none beside him. So either you kill Jesus because he's a false prophet and he's a liar, or you praise and worship him because you've seen what he did. And only God can only God can divide the seas. And right here, Jesus calmed those storms. That right there, whoever was there should have fell on their knees and recognized him as God. Because they know, they knew that God was the only one who can control the weather. Amen? Amen. The Bible doesn't teach that there's three gods. Yeah. The Bible teaches there is one God and His name is Jehovah. It shows that God came in the flesh. We read that in, in uh, Book of John, first chapter. Then we read that Jesus had to leave so He could come back as the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. So don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't teach there's three gods because Jesus was Son of God at the same time being God. This is the this is the Trinity. But we can't use an illustration to show how all three are one. The reason we can't, and I, I, I've had to repent of this now after reading this. Isaiah 40, verse 18, it says, To whom then will ye liken unto God? Who can be like God? Or what likeness will ye compare him unto? So what he's saying is right here. You know, we, we don't have a picture. We don't know what he looks like. So how can we make an image of him? That's what it's saying. Who can compare him to the Trinity. You know, I used to use the, the, the illustration of water, steam, and ice. But right here, God's telling me, hey, you can't compare me to anything. You can't. That's what He says. I mean, he, I, I use that, and that's probably not even close to what it's really like. Because right here, He says, you cannot compare me. You can't say, I'm like this or I'm like that. You can't compare. That's what this verse spoke, that's what this verse says, and that's why now I know. Well, the Trinity is like water, steam, and ice. No, it's not. The Trinity, I don't know how it is. I don't know how to explain it. Because God told me not, not to compare it to anything. Right. It's just there. The Trinity is there. The three are one. Now, for those of you who don't understand that, don't let that keep us from salvation or keep you from salvation. That's one mystery that we won't know until we get to heaven. We won't know. But it's real. The Trinity is for real. Jesus is God. But we've got to learn also how to separate Jesus God from Jesus Son of God. And if you read the scriptures correctly, if you read them correctly, study them, and not just read them, but study them, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the difference. Okay, this, this man who sweat blood, that was God. The Son of God, I mean. That was the Son of God. Because God can't sweat blood. <clears throat> So that was Son of God, Jesus. And there's many places I can show Him being 100% man. But you got to read it. you got to know how to read the Scriptures. Know when Jesus is talking about Jesus the God and know when it's talking about Jesus, Son of God. Right. Then you, you'll have a better understanding. But how all three of them are one, how God, how Jesus can be God in heaven at the same time being Son of God on earth. I can't explain it. And I don't know, and I don't know how to compare it anymore. He said, you can't compare me with anything. Amen? Amen? I just believe I have faith. I mean, that's what everybody has faith. I have faith in the Bible. I have faith on what the Bible says. That's where my faith is. If you don't want your faith there, then don't have it there. Take it somewhere else. But I truly believe that the faith I have is the real faith, is the living faith, is the faith that's, that's going to get me to heaven. Amen? Now, don't think when you're praying to Jesus that God's going to be upset. And you're praying to Jesus all the time. How come you're not praying to me? They're one. They're one. You can say, Lord, Father, or you can say, Jesus, you're, you're praying to the same God. Amen? 
So, I mean, really, I've heard that. Yeah. I've heard that. That's why I'm saying it. Because, well, you're always praying in, in Jesus. When do you pray to God? Uh, excuse me. They're both the same. I'm praying, I'm praying to one because they're the same. Yeah. Whether I say Father God or Jesus, it don't matter. It's the same thing. This is who we're making our sacrifices to. That's why I did all this to show us we're making our sacrifices to God. Even though Jesus was the final sacrifice, He was a sacrifice Himself, but, his sacri but it was going to God. Because Jesus, Son of God, was sacrificing. Not God. Jesus, Son of God, was the one sacrifice. So even He sacrificed Himself to God. Amen? You understand? So God is, we're not sacrificing to Jesus, we're sacrificing to God. Just as the courtyard spoke about salvation, you all remember when I talked about the altar and how it, spoke, how it shows salvation? We see that each of these items in the holy place, those three items that I just talked about, speak about Jesus, about salvation, the light. In fact, He is our high priest, Jesus. Who intercedes for us at the altar? Jesus. Who is the light that gives us life? Jesus. In the holy place, it shows us Jesus. He is the bread, He is the light, and He is our in inner intercessor. Intercessor. Amen. Mm -hmm. Isn't this the, the teaching of the tabernacle? It's you want to know who Jesus is? Let's study the tabernacle. Amen. The tabernacle, the holy place shows we need Jesus. When God made the tabernacle, He was saying, look, this is a shadow of my son because you're going to need him. I mean, this is what he's going to be like. Did God know what he was doing when he, when he built the tabernacle? He knew exactly what he was doing. Did we understand? Even those who were doing it back then, did they totally understand? But now, because of us, Having the Word of God, He can show us what He was doing. Just like the, just like Noah and the ark. He didn't know why He was building an ark. There was no water. There was no ocean. There wasn't even a river. But He built the ark. He didn't know what He was doing, but He did it because God told Him. Those priests did what they did because God told Him. And that's us in our life today. When God says something to us, either in a still small voice or in His Word, we need to listen. We won't understand. In fact, we won't understand several times. We won't understand. But He says it, we do it. Amen?